Jakob, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here in the Europe House uh, for this two-hour seminar on Brexit and its practical implications. Here in the Europe House, we are two institutions, the European Parliament and the European Commission, which is where I work. And we are not involved in any way, at least directly, in anything to do with the Brexit negotiation, of course. Nevertheless, Brexit is a fact of life for us as well, and not only in a negative sense, because it has also contributed to the launch of a discussion among the EU27 about what they want with the future of the European Union, a discussion that was to some extent launched by the European Commission with its publication of a white paper in March of last year. And that we work a lot with. So that discussion on the future of Europe is of course scheduled to continue to until May of 2019, the summit of the EU27 in Sibiu in Romania, <coughs> and the European Parliament election at the end of May. By contrast, the Brexit negotiations of course have a much tighter deadline, not the 29th of March 2018, the date on which the UK formally leaves the EU, but actually October of this year, by which time we have to have an agreement between us in order to allow enough time for ratification both by us and by the UK. So time is short, and I don't think it's a secret that the negotiations have not progressed as fast and as far as one could have wished for. And they are, of course, complex negotiations, and I'm sure you're going to hear a lot today about withdrawal agreements, transition periods, and various models and visions for the future of the EU-UK relationship. And <clears throat> even though we are now still discussing, to some extent, the issues that we had in principle agreed on back in December of last year, the negotiations are moving on to the phase where we discuss the future relationship. And the best evidence of that, perhaps, is that Friday and Saturday of last week, we had the visit of the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, in Denmark. This was his second visit to Denmark since all this started. And unlike the first time, where he stayed in Copenhagen and spoke mainly with parliamentarians and government officials and stakeholder organizations, this time he also went to the west coast of Jutland, to Chubuan, a fishing community. And of course, as you probably know, fisheries is one of the key priorities for Denmark in the Brexit negotiations. It's one of the sectors that's going to be the most affected by Brexit. So the discussions are moving on to the substance. I will not take any more of your time. Your time is also short today. I just want to welcome you once again, and I hope you have a fruitful and informative meeting, and hopefully leave more serene about what's coming than when you arrived. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jacob. And uh, right now I can see that Mr. Kobe is uh, arriving back, so we will have the pleasure of his company in a little while. Um, I'm the moderator today. Uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, Setland, a digital newspaper that uh, focuses on the nuance over sensations. Uh, we, we pursue the larger picture and try to understand where the world is headed. Also, I'm a huge idiot. Because in, um, in 2003, I was in Sweden, covering as a young journalist the, uh, the referendum on the, uh, the Swedish relationship to the Eurozone, and predicted a yes. I was in the Netherlands in 2005, covering the uh, European Constitution, um, and uh, was surprised at the outcome. I was surprised in Denmark in 2005, and I was very surprised in uh, the United Kingdom in 2016. And um, I must just say that I'm, I'm totally uh, unable to understand how wonderful it feels to cross your arms and say no. You know how empowering that feels. So I'm an idiot, but luckily we are joined by actual experts. Uh, and to begin with, I will uh, introduce Klaus Grobe, former Secretary of State, what we today call Departementchef in the Foreign Ministry. Uh, he is also the ambassador to the EU and also September ambassador to in, in London. And later we'll meet Marlene Vin, uh, who is a um, professor of European integration and a relentless uh, one-woman army in trying to um, make the world in Denmark understand the intricacies of the European Union. But uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Klaus Grobe.
Well, thank you very much, Lange, and thank you for today's work, and Marie, for in inviting me today together with Marlene, and to take you through the intricacies of, of Brexit. I would wish I was one of you, uh, and I would wish I could give you clear answers to all the questions. Uh, I can't. But I'll try to explain to you a little bit about where we are right now. Yes, thank you. That's certainly. So that's where we are, basically. After Theresa May's uh, speech uh, last Friday, I was in uh, I was in London and in the UK all week last week, and I will go directly from here to Brussels, and I will talk about the same thing with them because I want to find out more about what's going on. Nevertheless, there's a lot of debate in the media, notably in the British media, about Brexit. They haven't talked about anything else since uh, the eve of the 23rd of June, 2016. It is everywhere you meet people, every company you come to, every, every dinner you are to, they all talk about Brexit. But they all talk about different things about Brexit. There's no one single definition of Brexit in a British debate. Neither between the public, who voted for Brexit with a majority of 52%, neither inside the government, where they are also divided, nor in the British Parliament. So, what to do? Of course, the British government, notably after the elections in May last year, is an, in a relatively a fragile situation, but they, they have a majority. They have a majority together with 10 uh, supporters from the Unionist Party from Northern Ireland. And with that quite slim majority, and with the divisions inside the party, and with the weakening of Prime Minister Theresa May after the elections in May last year, she has to move very slowly forward of course, her political room of manoeuvre in the Brexit debate is very, very narrow if she wants to continue as Prime Minister. However, she's also shaped by the very fact that the divisions inside her party and the divisions inside her government mean they cannot agree either on who should replace her in, in, in case they wanted to replace her. So that, let's say, puts her in a relatively safe place, but not in a very short place for the longer term. We have seen some movement lately, but mostly in the British debate. In the negotiations in Brussels, we have not seen the same movement. And time is running out, let us say. At the negotiation table in Brussels, much less is happening in real terms than what actually takes place in the public debates, notably in the UK, but also in the public debates in, in the other EU countries. In order to explain to you what we are negotiating about, and looking on the speech that Theresa May holds last week, we are not talking about what she was talking about very much, namely the future, the future relations with the UK after Brexit. That she has tried to sketch out now, because we have kept asking her for the last one year and a half, well, what kind of future do you want? And she always said, I don't know, but what will you offer me? We will not offer anything, because it's not us who decided Brexit. That was Brits. So they have to find their way forward themselves, because we will not take upon us, neither Denmark nor any of the EU countries, the responsibility of defining Brexit, because we know very well that no matter how you define it, it will always be less worth, it will have higher cost than the continuing existing membership of the European Union. And we don't want to take the responsibility of that price, if I may say so, that responsibility has to be taken by the British government and by the British Parliament. And by the way, they also voted to take back control, so why not exercise that control, now we have the opportunity. Nevertheless, we are of course talking in Brussels 
but we are primarily talking and negotiating about the withdrawal agreement. And here I have taken this boring slide with me in order just to explain, because it's not so easy to understand what actually is going on. And then I think I will have to turn on my mic here and see if it works. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. What we are talking about now is what we in Danish call the skillsmith and hotel banning the divorce settlement. That's what's going to happen on the day of Brexit, which will be the 29th of March 2019. So that's around a year from now when the UK will leave the European Union by the two year deadline of the Article 50 notification and they will become a third country. We are also talking about, but we have not negotiated, we have presented a proposal to the Brits about transition, which is bridging the gap between the Brexit date and the date where a future relations agreement can be put in place. Hopefully, if we don't manage to do that, we might have a so-called cliff edge here. However, these two negotiations is one whole. The Brits, they think it's two different separate entities. The divorce settlement, who's going to have the, the Volvo, the dog, and the, how do we divide the debt and the money in the bank if there's any left. The transition is basically only a bridging or uh, arrangement. It's just telling the Brits, okay, from the day to day, we can, we can accept for a limited time period where we suggest a little less a little less than two years until the end of 2020, you can stay within the same obligations or you will lose your rights as a member state. So the proposal that we put forward, and it's out in the open, the transition is everything but institutions. So the UK could stay as if they're still a member of the European Union, we can still trade, we can still travel, we can still live in the UK and they can live and trade with us in the same way until the end of 2020. That's the proposal. The UK is very focused on the transition and not particularly focused on the withdrawal. You would tell me then, ah yes, but you made a political agreement in December last year, so that's fine and dandy. Well, the problem is we have not put it into legal text and the other problem is that there are several areas where we have not even talked with the British of the withdrawal conditions and it's on issues like international property rights, data protection, customs. Hello? They talk about customs all the time. We haven't talked with the Brits about customs. And all this we have to do. So we want to do that first together with that. And what takes place within the Article 50, the Intergovernmental Procedure, one whole agreement. So, if there's no agreement on the divorce settlement, there will be no agreement on the transition. And vice versa. So it's one whole, either one or the other. The UK is now saying to the media and press, we will agree on transition at the European Council in March. Well, that's their deadline. It's not our deadline. Our deadline is to agree to the whole legal text of withdrawal and transition by October, because that will leave us sufficient time to have the approval by the institutions and the necessary ratification. So it can enter into course in good time before the 29th of March 2019. On the transition, the UK are not really in disagreement on the conditions on which the terms that we suggest, but we have basically one discussion outstanding, but also a few other elements, also citizens' rights. Uh, namely, the length of the period. The European Union has said until the end of 2020, and they are very firm on that, because it coincides with the end of the present budgetary period in Brussels. And if you have to prolong the transition, one, there is a, a, a fear that it might turn into a permanent arrangement, so the temporary transitional element will be permanent, as you know, even life is temporary, no? Uh, the other issue is that if we go into the next budgetary period, 
it will become very complicated because then the issue arises, what does the UK have to pay into the budget if we continue? So in order to avoid that complication, we have suggested by the end of 2020. That principle is, of course, seen from a British point of view, that we can have a, an agreement on the future in place so there will not be any cleavage at the same date as the end of the transition. That is maybe sure, it's not sure, we don't know. Because it all depends on the nature and the content and the necessary, let's say, positions from the British. She has now finally made a speech. That speech was not so much to the EU countries, because it basically did not contain very much new for us, except some small movements in relation to European Court of Justice in relation to the recognition that there will be frictions, there will not be a membership of the internal market, there will be complications because there will not be membership of the customs union, and there will not be uh, ECJ jurisdiction in its present form, we'll have to find another way of doing it. But little by little she is moving her, let's say, Brexiteers and her opposition, she is nudging them a little bit forward, but the big question of course is if the speed in the nudging is sufficiently high in order to make sure that we can negotiate and ratify such an agreement before the end of 2020. And I think the Brits would like to have a longer period. They would like basically, they don't say how long, but I think they would like to have an open-ended period of transition in such a way that this is allowed to become more open-ended. But we don't think it's necessary. We think it's possible to do everything uh, within this, basically, a little bit more than two years, on the condition that the UK is ready to present, not a speech, but to present a very precise position on it. Until now, Mr. Barnier had not had any mandate to negotiate future relations. The only uh, mandate he, had, he got from the European Council in, in December was that he could talk with the Brits about scoping, let's say, finding out what kind of relations do we want to have. The red lines defined by the Brits already in the Lancaster House speech way back more than a year ago and repeated in speeches in Florence and in Munich and again repeated on Friday. If we assume that's really the British position out of the single market, out of the customs union, then that means we can only have a free trade arrangement for the future. Might not be a Canada model, leave that aside, but it will only be a free trade agreement. So there will be no longer membership of the internal market, but there can be access to the internal market for goods, but not necessarily for services or financial services, which is very important for the UK. And at the same time, also, we could expand uh, this uh, with other subjects uh, of interest to the European Union and to the UK, like air transport, land transport, fisheries, I know that's something the Danes are talking a lot about. <coughs> uh, basically speaking, we'll just have the same situation that we had before 1982, when we made the common fisheries policy. And, uh, and then we can talk about justice and home affairs to protect our internal security, where also the Brits wants to cooperate with us, and, and foreign security uh, policy. But all that uh, is we will have to discuss with the Brits in such a way we can put forward a negotiating mandate for the uh, Commission uh, and Barnier to negotiate a real treaty. The tricky point for that is that it is not based on Article 50, it's based on the Union Treaty Article 218, and that's the normal legal basis we use for agreement with third countries. That means that it's not the member states in the driver's seat, it's the Commission in the driver's seat. It also means that we have to define the mandate in the Council, the Commission negotiates, and then afterwards, it depends on the nature of the agreement, whether it has to be ratified by the 27 member states, like we did with the, the Canada agreement, and like we did uh, with the Ukraine uh, agreement, also. or whether it can be limited in scope 
only to the trade issues, the communitarian trade issues, in that way it can be approved by the institutions. But if we need to go through a ratification, because it also contains elements of intergovernmental nature, then uh, we know that we will need at least one year and a half to two years just to uh, fulfill the ratification period. And if that's the case, that means that we can do two things. We can either make a trade agreement with a limited scope, which can be put into force temporarily, and then, and then the rest will follow. So you divide it in two. We also did that with Ukraine. Or you can prolong the transition and then finish the whole process of ratification negotiation, which will probably take something like two or three years. Um, or, as I used to say to the British, you can also withdraw the notification <laughs> any day, and then we are, uh, we are no longer bound by the two-year deadline. But of course, politically speaking, that's not possible, at least not for the moment. As you remember what I say, all along this period of time, we still have the risk of no deal. But I would also like to say that one of the positive things, and there were several positive things in the message from Theresa May last Friday to the British people, it was that she didn't mention that no deal is better than a bad deal. But there still is a risk, not because somebody wants to have a no deal, but there's a risk that we run out of time, that we can't agree on the divorce and the transition, or we can't agree in time for having a future relations agreement. So there is still a risk all along that we could have a no deal scenario at a certain point of time. Let me finish also by saying what does that mean for you EU citizens outside the UK or for Danish businesses? It's obvious. For Danish businesses, it means, like for British businesses, we cannot, we cannot assume that we will change trade as normal as we have done up to now. There will be complications. And no matter how you twist and turn it, if you're not part of the single market, and if you're not part of the customs union, there have to be auto control. We can discuss where we have to put it, we can discuss how we are going to exercise our control, but there's no doubt that we will not compromise the integrity and the safety of the internal market by not, giving, not having auto control for goods. There will also have to be more control for persons. And as far as the system for future movement of labor and people after, after the transitional period, we don't know yet what the system will be. We have considered the matter inside the European Union, and we are thinking along the lines of the WTO rules for the exchange of workers and the exchange of border workers, uh, based on what we call mode 4 and things like that. But that's not the same as we have today. We know with, by the, from the negotiations we already have from the British what the situation will be at least until Brexit. They have, they have, they have assumed the responsibility that they until Brexit everything will be as it is today for the EU citizens living in the UK and we have really propagated that saying that, yes, everything will be as it is today for the UK citizens living in the EU. After Brexit, in the transition period, we still have a strike disagreement with the UK. We say, yes, we can also continue the existing rules of being able to work, and study, and live in each other's countries with social security and transfer of pensions and so on. But they say, we are not sure the cutoff date. We say that the cutoff date for that continuing of the existing rule should be in the transition. The Brits say, no, no, it's the 29th of March. They might give the same rights, but we have to negotiate it. Uh, we still have not seen a very precise position paper on it. But what they maintain is that in this period here, all the rules and rights should be derived from British legislation, not from EU legislation. And if there is disagreements and conflicts, it should be cited by British courts, not by the European Court of Justice or the Commission. So we have a discussion not only of the cutoff date, but we also have a discussion about who is going to control 
whether the EU citizens living in the UK uh, will have the same rights as today during the transition period. We have already told the Brits that as far as the UK citizens living in other EU member states, we will maintain the same rights and obligations under the same rules as they have today until the end of the transition. They presented the paper last week to the public, trying to give the impression, as a big concession, that they were going to get the same rights for new citizens living in the UK. But it's not, there is, as I said, there is this slight difference. So that has to be uh, negotiated uh, continuously. But we can say, hopefully, in the end, we can all agree that the rights for people living, working, studying in each other's countries, UK and the other, will more or less remain the same until the end of 2020. But you will have to apply for obtained civil status in the UK. So you cannot just sit on your, on, on your sofa. I was going to say something different. <laughs> and, 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 and stay passive. You have to make sure that you are residents period of five years is approved by the local authorities and that you will then uh, get the so-called settled status. We also agree there will have to be a much easier administrative procedure and basically speaking the moment at least until that day where you fulfill the five year requirement you will get the settled status automatically unless you end up in the criminal court but that's another story. Um, so that's basically where we are for the moment. So I would say, um, I hope that after the, the speech of Theresa May and all the considerations in the British government, that they will now be ready to negotiate because we have been waiting for them for more than one year and a half. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I can tell you that I only said yes to this uh, to being here because I wanted to listen to you. So, um, so it's always a bit scary to, to be the one following up on uh, what uh, Klaus Ruge has, has said. Um, however, uh, I have brought some, some slides. Um, I agree very much to, to what has, has already been said and, uh, and I, I, I Think that uh, think you're much closer to the actual negotiations to, to know what you know what's at stake and, and what's happening inside the EU right now. Uh, so I, I think I want to to um, uh, climb a little bit up in the sky and and uh, um, have some more principled discussion about what it actually is that the Brits are doing right now. Because I think for most people, uh, and I uh, apologize if I offend any Brits in here. Um, uh, it's, it's very, very hard to understand. Uh, and I think that uh, even for the Brits um, and those who voted uh, leave, um, a lot of things have, have been rather surprising and, uh, and uh, been, been not as, as they expected. Um, but if you look at the opinion polls in the UK, they are still um, very much on balance. So we have a very split nation, I would say. It's not, we haven't had a situation where within the past year uh, we have had a turnover for more uh, remainers. It's actually quite, I think quite 50-50, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, so, so I would say that, that having a new referendum is also something that, um, that is, is probably not uh, on the agenda at the moment. It could be later. Uh, but it seems that uh, it's been very, very hard for, um, for the politicians uh, to communicate uh, what uh, it actually entailed uh, to, to vote uh, leave. Um, I brought this one just to start out. Um, and, and I always use this slide when I speak about Brexit and Europe uh, to a larger audience. What is, the, what is it I'm trying to communicate here? I'm just trying to communicate to you and to my students and to everyone who wants to listen. If you look at it, look at how small Europe will be in not very many years. Uh, these numbers are summing up the uh, demographic development um, uh, in the world. And you can see in 1950, Europe was um, uh, 
constituted 22% of the population in the world. And in, 20, uh, in, in uh, 2100, um, Europe will only be 6% of the entire um, population on Earth. And I just think that it forces you to reflect a little bit on um, if Europe and the people living in the EU only amount to 6%, how, ma how many percent will the UK amount to? It is going to be a shrinking continent, and therefore uh, it's very, very important, I think, also to put this into perspective, despite the fact that the Brits think that they are still an imperial power. Uh, that must be the reason why they are leaving, right? Uh, I cannot make sense of it in any other way. Uh, but if they looked at the figures, they would also see that, that um, it is very, very, uh, it is a very different picture uh, we see out there. I also, I also uh, always use this to say, why not try to keep together? If we're only 6% of the, of, of the population on, on Earth, why not stick together instead of, 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 of leaving uh, the flock? But that's uh, my personal point of view. So, um, the big question, in my opinion, is will uh, the UK actually be more or less sovereign by leaving the EU? I'll come to the answer in the end. Um, we all know that the Brits have long had a very um, hard, uh, have some, some, some huge problems with, with being part of the European community. It's not a new thing. It's been going on for, for years and years and years. And it's not that far away from the Danish position, actually, because, because not just because we entered the EU at the same time, but because uh, Denmark, like the UK, actually wanted only the market and not the rest. Um, and that's a bit difficult. We, we do know, however, also from the negotiations right now, that the Brits, and I, I think Theresa May made that clear as well, uh, and has done so in several speeches, that uh, when it comes to defence, the Brits still want to be part of the European uh, defense setup, and uh, somehow they want to, 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 uh, to stick to that, and, and they have promised the, the Europeans that leaving uh, the EU does not mean leaving uh, Europe, first of all, but also it does not mean the, uh, leaving the defense structures. Uh, that's, of course, very comforting, uh, but the UK will not be uh, part of the new uh, PESCO um, uh, uh, structures in the EU where the, the remaining uh, European countries will try to work further together, much more together, uh, after Trump has said that everybody has to come to contribute more. Um, so what kind of relationship? We still don't know. Uh, as uh, Klaus Ruge also said, we don't even know very much about what it is, uh, what kind of relationship uh, the, the UK wants with Europe. But it's not just about trade. It's very clear that the Brits also want some kind of, of defense uh, collaboration. So um, in my opinion, um, being an expert on, on, uh, on conception of sovereignty, conceptions of, of democracy, and, and the way that different countries and nations think about uh, what it is to be a sovereign country and what it is to be a democracy, uh, there's one very, very um, important point that needs to be understood about the UK, in my opinion. And that is um, this idea that they have such a hard time accepting European law being supreme to, uh, to, to um, uh, UK law. We see it all through the debate up to the Brexit, uh, the Brexit referendum. We have seen it again and again coming up in uh, not just in the public debate, um, we also see it in, in uh, blogs, among academics. Uh, it's all over the place that it's very, very hard to accept uh, that EU has, uh, can claim supremacy of EU law or national law. We see all the debate about the, the court, what role should it have. Uh, and and um, it's, it's, in my opinion, uh, really interesting that as, as long as, it, as it's not called European law, they have no problem adapting to whatever arrangement we might come up with, which is uh, totally similar to Euro European law. And we're just, just not allowed to call, it, um, uh, to call it that. And we're not allowed to talk about the European court. Uh, we have to come up with another body that probably will be uh, completely copying what the European court is doing anyway. Uh, because we simply need some kind of arbitration 
uh, to uh, you know um, uh, differences uh, over how the future arrangement will be. Um, and, and I think one of the points is, of course, that you have this idea of sovereignty in Parliament. You have this idea that the Parliament is elevated above other branches of government, and uh, and therefore ex having to accept European law is very difficult. We have a little bit of the same in Denmark, where we also see uh, no one over above the Parliament, uh, and accepting having to accept that sometimes our national laws can be set aside uh, is is hard to accept for for some people. Um, uh, but but uh, the question is, of course, that if you did not uh, accept that, we would not have a European Union. Uh, so you cannot have a pick and choose. Uh, and that is obviously what the UK wants. They want to have um, uh, migration, uh, free movement of workers. They cannot accept that, but they will, um, at least that's what they've said, they will um, have, have less problems accepting other parts of the four freedoms. And that is obviously not doable uh, because the four freedoms go together. And uh, if you accepted all of a sudden that you could have the cake and, cake and eat it too, uh, you would not have a European rule of law and you would immediately have the Norwegians. Um, I talked to the Norwegian ambassador uh, not very long ago and he said we will immediately demand the same conditions if uh, being um, uh, Part of the EEA would mean that that uh, that the Brits would have uh, uh, something better than than than, uh, than Norway has. So um, so it's not just a question about how do we accommodate a big nation like the UK. Uh, it's also about how do we treat our other um, collaborators in this respect. So a Europe a la carte is is ruled out, and 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 that is probably where. Um, some of the problems are because that is what the UK in, in the negotiations have been pushing for all along. They have really tried to 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 be able to pick and choose. And and uh, recently, Theresa May also said that she could not understand why you couldn't work together closer in some sectors and not in others. Uh, why do we have to take the whole package? She couldn't understand that when it comes to trade and, and uh, divide the sectors up, and uh, the Brits have made references to other types of um, trade, trade deals that Europe has with, um, uh, with other um, uh, world powers, um, referring that uh, we are splitting up, uh, and it's not necessarily a condition that you, you accept everything. But that is something that the EU has been very firm on, and I think one of the most impressive things, actually, about the whole process uh, since uh, the um, uh, the referendum has been that the EU has been so um, firmly standing so firmly together, and it's uh, the UK has not managed to split the European uh, Union. Um, there is a, a huge uh, um, sense of understanding that the EU has to uh, has to to stand together and to um, not to split and not to make uh, different deals with the UK. Uh, at least up until the um, up until the tr the, the, the December um, um, uh, agreement, uh, which wasn't really an agreement, as Klaus Gruber also said, uh, because what is really clear, um, there was this idea that that we should finish uh, phase one before we move to phase two, um, but. Uh, but, but it really is difficult to, to, see, uh, to see these issues as, as truly settled. Um, so, uh, so we're in this position right now that, that um, uh, uh, is, it, is it clear, um, the settlement agreement, uh, is it clear what the contribution to the, to the future budget should be, or to, to, uh, to the budget should be? Um, not the future budget for sure, but um, what the UK should pay for leaving, uh, you know, all the commitment, commitments they made <coughs> earlier, uh, what should they actually pay? Um, uh, yes, well, they did say that they honoured the commitments asked for in, in, in some ways, um, uh, and, and this seemed to be enough to move to, to phase two, at least. There's nothing clear, in my opinion, on, on the Irish border. It's almost every day we get some kind of new sense of what the UK wants in this area. And uh, last week, I think you saw this uh, very heated debate in the uh, parliament in the 
London, uh, where um, Barnier and his people had drawn up a legal, uh, tried to come up with some kind of legal draft for how it could be, it could be organized and, and uh, having a, a border um, in, the, uh, in the sea between um, the UK and Northern Ireland. Uh, that was considered as the EU wanting to actually take over Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and, and no prime minister would ever accept that in the UK, uh, Theresa May said. Uh, but I completely agree with uh, what Klaus Ruben has just said about uh, some kind of border is necessary. Um, it's not enough to have technologies to overlook what kind of, of goods comes coming to the EU. You have to remember that the EU, uh, and it's not just to be annoying to the, to the Brits, it's really important to understand that the internal market has very high safety standards. And we cannot just have an open uh, space where uh, not only goods, but also people and everyone can just drive in and out of, of the EU. Um, there has to be some kind of, of uh, security that what we put into our mouth and what we trade with each other inside the EU is actually living up to all standards. Um, so, so there will have to be a border somehow, and, and, and this is uh, very unsettled, and I would even uh, say that uh, the Irish border question could end up sort of tearing the whole thing apart, uh, because um, this is very, very sensitive uh, and, and something that can, uh, that can uh, provoke an election again in the UK, um, and, uh, and then perhaps uh, uh, put uh, Jeremy Corbyn in the in the, in in Westminster in the in Downing Street ten. Um, so uh, so so these issues have not been 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 uh, clearly settled at least not legally in any way, uh, and we still wait for some kind of legal document from from uh, from uh, the Brits. What about the uh, EU citizens in the UK? Klaus uh, Hobe was discussing it briefly. Um, it's, it's, it's also only partly clear. Uh, and there was a very interesting case at the European Court of Justice um, uh, not very long ago, um, which discussed whether uh, it was a solution to naturalize if you are an EU citizen living in the UK uh, and you um, are so afraid of losing your rights that you uh, fast and quickly try to become a, a UK citizen. That might actually not be the, the, the best way to do it because you could uh, risk losing your EU citizenship and those rights you have as an EU citizen. Um, and in this case, uh, it was a case uh, at, at the court, uh, it discussed a Spanish woman moving to, uh, with her Moroccan husband, moving to, uh, to the UK, and, um, and, and she was told that she could not uh, have this person moving to the UK because now she had become a British citizen. Uh, but the case went to the court in Luxembourg and the court said, um, uh, that uh, because she was previously an EU citizen and previously a migrant, uh, then she could still rely, and she actually had moved from, uh, from uh, Spain to, to the UK, even though she lived in the UK for 20 years, she could still rely on her EU rights. It's a quite interesting judgment. Uh, but it does tell you something about um, it does tell you something about um, the difficulties uh, that you will face here um, uh, uh, and, and also the fact that the EU court will not be able to make these kind of decisions in the future if the EU, with the UK leaves, uh, leaves the, the, the EU. Um, so um, naturalizing is not necessarily the way to solve your problems if you are uh, living in, in uh, in the UK as an EU citizen, uh, even though I think a lot of people have done that, just as many UK people living in other European countries have applied for citizenship in that country. Um, so we had this, uh, this uh, lawful status discussion in the UK um, uh, not very long ago, and, um, and, and uh, it was, as Klaus Ruge also said, uh, trying to comfort everyone that things will be as they've always been, but there has already now been a lot of discussion in the media and also among lawyers whether um, uh, it, you can really be sure that you are treated uh, just as, as, as you were previously. And at least those who cannot provide the necessary evidence that they have been in, uh, living lawfully in the, in the UK for five years 
um, and are not able to come up with that documentation, uh, they will not, uh, they will not uh, be uh, safe. Uh, and that, of course, does probably not concern anyone in this room, uh, but many of those who work uh, in, the, um, in the farming industry and so on in the UK uh, may not be able to, and those who are in the cash economy, I heard somebody call it, um, uh, where you probably don't have so many documents, um, to say it in a nice way, um, uh, it's, it, it's, it's of course very difficult to, to prove that you, uh, that you have been working uh, in. Uh, and for those people, this, it's not going to be so easy, all those procedures that are not now set up to make it easier to, 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 to gain this lawful status uh, after Brexit. Uh, so also in this area, we still don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that's, of course, uh, a bit scary for, for all those who, who um, live there and uh, come from other parts of the European Union. This I just brought to show you um, who the UK are actually trading with. So when uh, Boris Johnson and others say that they, they want to trade with uh, you know, other big powers in the rest of the world after Brexit and therefore they cannot accept a customs union, um, uh, look at that. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't look very convincing uh, in terms of uh, what to build on um, when it comes to, to, um, to the rest of the world. So the EU is really s still incredibly central. Um, both uh, in my, my claim today would be that both uh, inside and outside the EEA, the Brits will likely end up copying uh, uh, EU law. Uh, so, um, uh, there is of course this debate in the UK, as you probably heard, uh, that uh, whether you know, the Norwegian solution would be a, a, a way to stay in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the single market, but, but be out of, um, uh, be out of, of the EU. Um, but I would argue that um, even if you skip um, you have a hard Brexit and skip the single market and the customs union, you will necessarily have to uh, actually copy uh, EU law. You may not have to abide to the court directly, but uh, if you don't adapt your products uh, to EU law standards, uh, regulations to EU standards, nobody wants your goods. The EU does not want to import goods that do not live up to, uh, to EU standards. Um, that would be a, a, a undermining and also a danger to the safety. Uh, so my point is that, um, that it's really very much built on this illusion that, uh, all right, you, you may be formally outside, uh, but, uh, but in reality, uh, um, alignment uh, they talk about uh, all the time, whether EU law, uh, British law has to be aligned to, uh, to um, EU standards. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so in my opinion, uh, this is really a game of illusions uh, to, to a large extent. Um, if uh, Corbyn comes into power and he is convinced um, um, that that convinced that that is probably better. I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about in, in one two years time, and everything sort of looks more and more difficult. I, I wouldn't completely. Uh, um, rule out that the, the, that the UK might have an, another referendum and they could dec decide in this referendum whether they wanted to stay in the internal market, the single market, and you could end up with a majority saying yes, for God's sake, let's stay there. And the problem is of course uh, that you would then have a UK um, paying into the budget uh, as they do today as members. And the problem with that is of course that Norway pays uh, I think on average, uh, the same into the EU budget per citizen uh, as the UK does today. Uh, Norway even pays more per citizen uh, than Italians. So, so it's not a guarantee to, to keep your money in your pocket, mm -hmm. uh, to, to be out of, of, uh, of the EU and in the internal market. And, and, to, and to this comes, of course, that you have to follow all the laws and you don't have any say on anything. Uh, right now, it's very heated in the British debate uh, and, and everybody rejects this entirely, um, also Theresa May, and that's why I think what they are going for right now is leaving both the EEA and uh, 
they are leaving both the single market and the customs union. The customs unions, obviously, for good, for good reasons, because if they didn't give that, they couldn't negotiate with all those uh, uh, trading blocks they want to negotiate with in the future. It would have to be the EU. Um, and the single market, because it would be a joke, almost, to have a, um, a Brexit and then uh, end up, as Boris Johnson has called it, uh, a vassal state. Uh, because uh, obviously uh, you lose all your seats in the parliament, you lose your um, council ministers, you lose commission, you lose all the employees, uh, and, and, and you still have to abide by the same laws. Uh, it, it works fine for Norway for some reason. Um, I have never been able to figure out how and why. Uh, I've asked them many times. Uh, but, um, uh, but this kind of copy-paste democracy, where you copy-paste the EU law and put it into your own law, it, 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 it works nicely for the regions, but, but uh, I have a hard time seeing it in the UK. Um, but if things go, in the, if, if, if the negotiations go really, really wrong, and, and you have a deteriorating economic situation in the UK, you have a change of mind, uh, among citizens, and citizens start feeling that this is probably not such a good idea anyway to leave the EU. People might lose their jobs, companies moving out of the UK, all kinds of things can happen. Uh, then, um, uh, and a new government uh, that will <coughs> launch a new referendum, uh, you could end up uh, in that situation. Uh, I wouldn't completely uh, rule that out. So, um, uh, these are the, the, the models that a lot of people are discussing, um, a lot of, of, of those dealing with Brexit at the moment, um, uh, what kind of options are there, and uh, Klaus Grobe talked about the Canada solution, um, and I agree with you that uh, we could easily end up with something completely different. Um, the Brits are very concerned that what they should get is not going to be called the same as what is already on the shelf. It's very important for them that it's called something special for me because they are special. Uh, so you may end up in with a model that is 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 a, is, is some kind of of, of, of um, deal that is close to the Canadian model, uh, but has uh, you know extra benefits. Um, even though I do not think the Norwegians will accept that it approaches um, the benefits of the single market without having all the commitments as well. Uh, I really don't think the EU will accept that. Uh, that is clearly what the, the Brits want. Uh, and uh, the problem with the Canada, Canada uh, option is, of course, that services, financial services are not included. Um, and therefore, uh, and what I heard was that two thirds of, of the British economy relies on services. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's yes, approximately eighty percent of the GDP. Eighty. Eighty-five percent. Wow. So it wouldn't help much <laughs> uh, if you didn't include services in the, in what kind, whatever kind of kind of deal you would come up with. So. Um, the Swiss uh, solution, maybe Klaus, you know more about why this is, because I never understood why this is completely ruled out. What I understand is that it's simply too complex. It's simply too, uh, it's I think 30, 133 different bilateral uh, agreements. Um, and, and, and the Swiss also have to abide by EU law. Uh, so uh, so it, it's a mess completely. Uh, and therefore, the EU does not want to go that, that way. And, and it, it's in the mindset of many negotiators, uh, it really is the Canadian and the Norwegian new solution. They may, not, may, may end up calling it something different, <laughs> but uh, it will be uh, either close to, 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 to the one or the other. Um, and the WTO uh, solution would, of course, be uh, the cliff edge. Uh, that we heard about before, if no agreement is, is found, uh, no trade agreement, then it will be on VTO rules, uh, all kinds of, of negotiations in the future. So the essential just last question that I promised I would, I, would, uh, I would answer, or try to answer, or come with my contribution to at least, is uh, what, um, uh, what is sovereignty in the 21st century? I think sovereignty and taking back control has been very, very uh, cardinal to the debate of Brexit. And it's also very, very important in this country. In this country, we are also uh, obsessed with sovereignty. 
Uh, very few people know what it really means. But if you use the word, we have done several surveys about uh, if you say if you want to cooperate in this area, oh yeah, great. But if you lose sovereignty, oh no, then we don't. Uh, so it's it's really something that is 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 of central concern uh, to a lot of of, um, of people uh, in in uh, both Denmark and the UK. Uh, in the UK, it's been translated into taking back control of our of our own laws. Uh, but the question is, in the end, in my opinion, whether you really want to be a rule maker or a rule taker. Because if you uh, only want to take uh, other people's rules and then feel you are more sovereign, because that's what happens in, in Oslo, um, yeah, you are formally more sovereign because you are outside. But are you really more sovereign when you have to uh, take all the rules that somebody, somebody else has have produced for you? Or do you want to, to be a rule maker and be more sovereign by <coughs> contributing, influencing the rules that are created jointly with other countries? Is that to be sovereign today? I would argue it is, uh, but you still have this zero-sum game going on and it's, it's obviously very, very difficult to, 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 to sort of con convey uh, in discussions uh, with um, so-called ordinary people, what it actually means today to be a sovereign country. Um, so uh, the question is um, um, whether uh, you are taking back control uh, if you leave the EU as Boris Johnson and others want, uh, if that really means that you can take back uh, control in the sense of, of having your own laws. Of course, formally it would be you who produce the laws, but tons and tons of that legislation will be copied directly from EU law. Uh, but you have to be careful here because fiction very often uh, has to do with emotions, and uh, emotions matter in politics. I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, this is, of course, a, a great drama. And it's a um, political drama, and it, I just the thought of being in Theresa May's uh, shoes, like brings terror to my feet. But, uh, but at the same time, I think one of the problems is that the more you think about where we are right now, the easier it is to get a headache. Because as, as, as what you just said shows, everything is unacceptable to someone. And uh, it, it, it looks at sometimes to be like an insolvable knot. But at the same time, you can say markets are relatively calm and have been. And, you know, so my question is to you first, Klaus, is there a case to be made for everything to end up fine in the end? You know, is that, is that really like a realistic uh, path uh, going forward? Don't ask me about that. No. <laughs> but what, what is fine? I, <laughs> I think that's also a very emotional way yeah. of talking. I would say, uh, as long as we have not agreed anything, withdrawal agreement, transition, future relations agreement, we might, there is a risk we will end up with nothing. Nothing is nothing. It is WTO rules, but that's hugely different from today's relationship with the UK. Uh, it could manage, we could manage in goods, but in services, people relations. Uh, the way we invest in each other's countries, the way we interact, we travel, will be completely changed. And it will be quite dramatic, not least for the Brits. The um, Treasury and many other clever people, but it was forbidden by the British government for the civil servants to calculate any economic scenarios, but finally uh, they, they made it. There was nothing new in that, I can tell you. I have a number of scenarios on my on my desk, which has been produced by all sorts of clever people, including the Treasury, since before the referendum, and they basically all show the same. If you end up without a deal on WTO rules, it will probably cost the UK approximately between 6, 6 to 8 percent of GDP in loss over five years. And if you go to the best case scenario, like a Norway model, it will only cost them approximately 2 percent of GDP over a five-year period. For Denmark, a country which is, tra is trading quite closely with the UK, not as closely as Ireland and maybe not as closely as Belgium or the Netherlands, 
but then they nevertheless it's our fourth biggest uh, market for goods and services and investment. Uh, it will cost us approximately, in the worst case scenario, something which is similar to between half and a whole percent of GDP. It's manageable. Of course, it's not something you want, something you look for, but it's in the same order, more or less, that when we introduced the sanctions uh, towards Russia after Crimea, uh, and, 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 and the Russians made counter sanctions. So, and the issues we now have with the, the UK on steel and aluminium, even though it does not hit Denmark directly so much, it could also, uh, let's say, give us losses to that extent. So it's manageable, it's not something we want. But end up fine. I cannot see it for, I cannot only see that it, it will end up less fine than it is today. However, of course, economy, economics is a funny thing. It always have to, it finds its way. So maybe in 10, 20 or 50 years time, I don't know, maybe we would be back, but then you will have a lost period where you could have grown even further if you have stayed in the European Union. What you cannot give up is the loss you might have in political terms. We, the UK will lose in political terms and we will also lose in the European Union in political terms. There's no, you shouldn't hide the fact that the European Union will be smaller when the UK leaves as a member of the European Union. That's obvious. Then we could try to compensate it for it with still cooperating closely with them in, in, in foreign policy and security policy, for instance. But, and the UK will be even smaller. You talked about sovereignty. You see, it's not about deciding for yourself. If they really meant that the British Parliament should be sovereign in all its form, the government would have left the British Parliament to decide about Brexit. They would have left the British Parliament to approve uh, the mandate for negotiations and approve the, and it's still for discussion in British politics with the government, whether they should have a final say on that mm -hmm. before in such a way that they could influence the end of negotiations and not just to say yes or no. Uh, with, uh, so that's for parliamentary sovereignty, you can see. It's not about that. It's about identity. It's about emotions. But a country cannot live from its identity and emotions alone. Sovereignty, the real power of action, your ability to influence others in such a way that you obtain benefits to your society and your country, that they will lose. Because you can, in Denmark and in UK's case, it's not true that we only went into the European Union because of the market. We, it was also to enhance our sovereignty, our room of maneuver in economic terms to influence WTO negotiations, to influence the United States to give us better concessions because if we stand together 500 million people, it's actually you are might more powerful than 5 million people. All that they will lose. And also Brexit, I can tell you, not many people on the outside the European Union or, no, or outside the UK understands really why the UK does it, because it's not really rational. If it were rational, they wouldn't do it. So it's emotional, and of course it has to be understood. But that's also why that the UK is now looking for something, let's say, in between. But it will not be fine. That will have to be paid a price. It has taken a long time for the British Prime Minister to tell the British people the truth. Namely, they will have to pay a price. That she said on Friday. But they still have not defined precisely. And that's the whole crux of the matter for the British government, for the British Parliament, for the British people. Where is the balance point between being sovereign and decide for yourself, take back control, and on the other hand, the economic cost for growth and employment. The more sovereign you are, like North Korea, probably most sovereign country in the world, <laughs> the higher the price you will have to pay for growth and employment. And the further you will be away from the European Union. And vice versa. So where is the balance point? Where is the balance point between the growth and employment costs or the sovereignty? And that's exactly what they are looking for. And basically, I think if the British Prime Minister was here today and I asked her that question, she wouldn't probably know the answer because you have to find out during way in order to make sure that you could get as good a deal as possible. That's the same we do. We're not born yesterday. We have known the Brits for more than 1,000 years. 
And we want to make sure that the benefits they will get, they should deserve, but they should not be to the detriment of Danish businesses and Danish workers and Danish growth. When you uh, just just a comment to your, what, what you were talking about with Norway, I know there's a very little interest in Norway to joining the EU because they feel sovereign even if they're not just to say sovereign. So also something you can you can feel. I think we would be able to do the same thing in Denmark if we had yes. to. We would just pretend to be to be sovereign. We, to some extent, we already do. Malene, um, you talked about the conundrum of the Irish border as something as one of the things that very hard to see an easy solution to. Uh, that has to do with the customs union, which has to do with the opportunity for business going forward. Right now, if you look at, at, at what's going on in, in the UK, and you were a, a business owner or a student or somebody you know, trying to figure out whether to look in that direction or somewhere else to a different country in the EU, you know, couldn't you, wouldn't it be obvious to say this is, this is a very risky bet that, that things you know, will not be costly if you, if you invest in in the UK? You mean if you were a student and this... I had to choose between studying in, 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 yeah. in, in London or studying in, in, in Paris, for instance. Yeah, I think that, that um, in the future at least um, it, it will probably mean, unless there are some very good deals made uh, with Erasmus and other programs that, that, that continue in the future, and I think they would like that, um, then uh, I, I think we will see a, a, a larger interest for studying in the rest of the EU than in the UK. Um, also because of you know diplomas and so on, how do we make sure that they are accepted and all that. There are so many things. Um, but um, I have a hard time um, really believing that the UK will not really push very hard to get some good agreements on uh, research and uh, Exchange of you know students, uh, so so um, I think that that that's what I heard at least that that's something they prioritize very highly, uh, and therefore uh, to be quite honest, I don't think that that will be um, in, in, in affected the mm -hmm. most. I think there will be much worse to other sectors than uh, the whole research area, um, because the Brits are already now very good at getting uh, money from the EU in terms of research money. And students are happy to study in the UK, uh, mainly because of the language, but also because of, of, uh, of good universities. So, so this is something they are going to push very hard to get, uh, to continue working with the EU in, in this area. And what about the business side? Because I, I think I, I, I hear you say that, that there are there are going to be a cost in terms of, of you know, hiring internationally and, and of course trading, both services and, service and goods. Is, is, you know, is, what would you think about that side of it? If you, if you were to well, we have already seen position. that several companies are deciding to, to, to establish themselves in, on the continent instead of the, in, of the UK. Uh, I think a lot of businesses are still waiting to see uh, the, the, uh, the outcome of everything before they make a big decision. Uh, some are moving to Ireland. Um, I heard an, uh, an Irish uh, property owner saying that the uh, demand for Irish property has been going like that. Um, so, so I think that, that um, they, they are probably already now experiencing uh, some, some effects uh, in terms of losing jobs simply. Um, so, so that is, is, is definitely going to happen. Uh, also because it's much, much easier for business to be on the continent and working with the rules that are, you know, 27 countries have the same rules. It reduces transaction costs. It's much, much easier than to have to deal with, with uh, odd rules coming out of the UK. Uh, so it's, it's simply about that, I think, for most businesses. So, so I, just thought, I just think it takes a while before you really see the big effect in terms of losing jobs. I also think a lot of the jobs are in the sectors for the highly educated who will remain. So we'll see, I think soon, uh, those who voted uh, leave were, uh, were the lesser educated and, and, and um, that whole sector, and they will probably, not until this year, next year, start feeling it, it, the hardship on themselves. Mm. Um, the ones working in the financial institutions, they already voted to stay, I'm sure, mm. uh, and, and they know what they're doing, and many of them, uh, I know both, if, I mean, if, if give, you, give you an example. Normally we get like 30, 40 uh, applicants for an associate professorship in my department. Uh, it's not more than three months ago we, we uh, 
um, had a, a, a had had a, um, a whole procedure again for for recruiting, uh, and we had 450 applicants for something you normally get 50. Um, I, I think Copenhagen is, of course, uh, uh, you know, attractive because we, we do a lot of our teaching in English anyway. Uh, British, no, uh, Netherlands, uh, Dutch, Dutch universities and, and, and Danish universities uh, are looked upon as places you can go if you speak English and would, would like to work in, in very good universities. Uh, but it's a very good example. I also know from, from, uh, from people in Brussels that uh, the increase in applications have gone hugely, I mean very steeply off. So I think that people are already reorienting themselves and, and, and it's, it's, it's only going to be worse in my opinion. Yeah, especially if you go down the lines that you showed yeah. and, uh, and, and things don't progress. Um, I'd like to ask uh, if any of you have, have questions, there's a microphone uh, ready in the back that we'll bring to you before you start asking uh, questions. Yeah. The gentleman in the, in the front here. Accepting that uh, you have mentioned that it is the uneducated who have voted to leave and looking at your pie chart. And then it is not only the uneducated. No, I said mainly. Mainly, yeah. But I think also there is a, a portion of people in the same age as, uh, as in this room. Who, yes. Who still believe that Queen Victoria is alive. <laughs> and who sort of are in the Midlands and so And, you know, somebody in the UK ought to wake up. Because this decision here, as you have clearly pointed out, there are absolutely no winners. And uh, they should not be allowed to create that kind of turmoil we are now facing. You see, they also believe, remembering your pie chart and seeing the Asian part of our business, they still believe that the Commonwealth is a very effective function and that India is part of the Commonwealth. The Indians have told the Brits what they think about that. And you know, I think that common sense ought to prevail and for somebody to get these people out of the decision-making process. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you were right. <laughs> yes. discussion so far, um, perhaps accepting this last comment, which I find quite um, worrying to a certain extent, that, you know, that people who voted in a particular way should not be allowed to vote. Anyway, my question is that in this whole uh, debate, um, I, I followed it because uh, I studied uh, British pop populism and wrote my thesis about it. Um, and I've generally found that researchers and commentators are very hostile towards um, uh, British people, especially, but also uh, more generally towards uh, Euroscepticists. But when it comes to populists who are centre, centre left, they're much less hostile even though it's actually the same, uh, what you might call it, um, the, state, the same forces at stake. Is that not a problem that we have that institutional bias in academia and also in politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a tough question. Um, I don't know. I think um, the, I, I, I imagine uh, also from, from uh, the data we have of those who voted leave in the UK that uh, it was not right-wing necessarily, it was just as many uh, left-wing uh, people who voted uh, leave. Uh, I was just talking about uh, uh, the education level, and that is pretty clear from all the surveys made on this, uh, that those who will have the toughest time outside the, uh, the EU are, are the ones with the uh, least, in, least uh, uh, income and, and also the least education. They will be hardest uh, hit by, by this. And that's not just just a prejudice. That's that's out there. There are data on that. Um, so so uh, so so I don't think uh, that we have a. Uh, of course, you have had for many years uh, a lot of discussions about right wing populism, but you see also lots of, of left wing populism. And and Corbyn certainly hasn't 
been treated nicely in the British media. He has certainly been been criticised, and a lot of pe people think he is from from a, a different century. Uh, so so uh, uh, on that one, I think it's it's not so straightforward. Um, Klaus, you have a comment? Yeah, I would say I don't necessarily think there's an institutional bias. But I think the researchers and scientists are like, are like diplomats. We are always rational. We are, and we assume every, everybody else are rational. And it's obvious, if you look on Brexit from a rational point of view, it doesn't make sense. Why go through all this if you could stay in the European Union and then work together with Denmark and the Netherlands and Germany? to reform the European Union from inside, instead of going through this whole thing. But there is an emotional part. Also, uh, the elder conservative core electorate, who is about identity, it's about emotions and about values. But Brexit also shows that you, if you give way for that in politics, you can suddenly find yourself in a place where you don't want to be. Hmm? And that should serve as a lesson to all politicians in all other European countries. I can tell you, they are all following that very closely. But you can see it happens in German elections, in Austrian elections, not to the extent that we uh, feared, in Italian elections. What a mess. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, it, we don't have to criticize those like UKIP or like others who pursue the populist agenda. No, you have to ask to the established parties, those normally running our countries, that they have to come up with solutions and ideas, concrete ideas and solutions, to those who voted for Brexit, because they're not voting for the European Union membership. It's not about that. It's about the economic and social situation, which they think is, is bad, and they fear it cannot be worse, so they vote for something, something has to change. Like Mr. McCorber and Oliver Twift, is always for hoping something will show up, no? Because that's better than today. And that's what you have to think about. Because in the UK debate, they also want to make a success out of Brexit. But I keep telling when I was an ambassador now, I can only write it in the newspapers or make say it in speeches. You cannot make a success out of Brexit for your own country unless you deal with the underlying reasons for why 52% of the population voted for Brexit, which has nothing to do with the European Union. It's about economic, uh, it's about social issues, it's about also geographical uh, differences between Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and, and England for that sake too. It's also about nationalism in these entities, about the future of the UK Union and about the future of the UK's relations with the rest of the world which actually will be defined by the way they define their future relations with the EU. So that's what it's all about. And I know for politicians, this is too many questions at the same time. They can't manage it. So they take it incremental, as I would say, step by step. But I think eventually, well, let's come back to my rational diplomacy. Eventually, I think we will end up with all our feet on the ground. <laughs> but it, the process carries a risk, and that's why I say there is a risk all along that the whole thing can fall apart. Thank you. One, one could say that now you're again using rational arguments against uh, sure. emotional drivers. But uh, yeah, I think sure, I, because, because I would say I could recognize something playing out in Denmark yeah. that could be quite similar to, uh, to uh, and we've seen it before. Yes, Denmark. and that's why I say it in order to prevent it. Yeah. There was a question, uh, yeah. I think, yeah. You have uh, both very ably sort of stated uh, where, where we are now, and in a parenthesis, it must be a few... You have both very uh, ably stated where we are now in the negotiation, and uh, in a parenthesis, you could say the bureaucrats around in the Brussels and in the countries, they must have a field day. Uh, really, uh, the work is really cut out for them. But what my question really is, uh, to the extent that what you have described, the obstacles, the difficulties, that they are becoming part of the discussion in Britain, in the broader discussion in Britain, 
I think you could, as a, a British elector, you could say that, well, this wasn't quite what, was, what we voted about. Uh, it wasn't what Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage and all of us told us the situation would be. So that's why I'm a bit uh, surprised that you are more hesitant that there could be a rerun of a referendum. Um, because this was not described, perhaps it could be described in the details, but it was a completely different world which was outlined and what we see now. So if you would care to comment on that. Yeah, Klaus, you were actually shaking your head, I noticed, when uh, Marina was talking yeah. about the possibility yeah. of... Um, but I don't necessarily you know? disagree with it, but it, we all talk about timing. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I would say it in a short term, because I can obviously see time is running, but I don't believe that a referendum can be held for political reasons uh, on the present basis, or better say, on this side of an election. Hmm? Um, you cannot, because what should be the reason for that? You decided to, the parliament decided to call for a referendum. And they decided it was a, a, it was not a binding re no, it was referendum. Not. It no, was not binding. no. But then they decided after that that it would follow the result, yes. and they had a majority, four hundred and sixty-five votes in the British Parliament. So they will have to decide again, and you have to find a majority. I'm not sure that majority will exist because they are so afraid that if they do it, basically speaking, telling the British people you made a mistake, no? mm -hmm. then they will most likely get. The opposite result, instead of 52, 48 for Brexit, they might get 75% for Brexit and 25% for Remain. Because people will fe be feeling offended. And you know one thing I learned from my years in, in the UK? British electorates are the, exactly the same like Danes. They don't want to be pushed around by politicians. No. So, the other thing is, we cannot exclude, of course, that after an election, a new majority will find its way into the British Parliament. Uh, and then we could maybe see a situation. But the, the problem here is that time now, you cannot see my time schedule. But that, we will, that will bring us beyond the 29th of March 2017. And you see, that's also why I think that if they are, for many of the real Brexiteers, they are maybe not so interested in the ins and the outs of the negotiations. On, unless they, they only want to make sure that they actually leave the 29th of March 2019 as a member, because they know from that moment on it would be more difficult to come back. But you could also argue that in order to come back after such a whole process, it might be maybe helpful and useful that you get out for a period and then you come back because you, these people find out it might not be the brightest of all ideas. Because when the UK, if the UK comes back one day eventually, you would also like the UK to be a trustworthy and reliable partner and not having an ongoing debate in the UK, not about, let's say, uh, uh, Brexit, but about exactly whether we, we, why we entered it again. So, so you see, you have to think about how can you create the best possible conditions for a fully fledged membership of the European Union and not a membership like the Danish one, where you have a lot of exceptions and you are outside many elements like the Euro. And the Brits are inside just in home affairs and they would also like to be there. They are inside defense. They would also like to be there as close as possible, uh, but they will have to find another footing for, for him, such a referendum. Otherwise, I am afraid, in the present parliament, in the present mood in the British population, the most likely is a new referendum will confirm Brexit. Yeah. Um, and even if, yeah. in, even if it didn't confirm, uh, or even if there was a, a, a slight majority uh, to remain in the next referendum, you would still have a completely split country. Uh, and, and I agree with you that, that working in that country where people feel defeated, they feel that you, you cheated on us. We, you just had another referendum and then uh, there was a small, small, small margin who said, remain. That will not necessarily be uh, a very good uh, yeah. partner to be, be more divided country possibly. Now the time is running out. And uh, so, so just really quickly, Malin, the final question, because I like to end, uh, well, I think we all do on a positive note. Mm -hmm. Now we have, a, uh, mm -hmm. we have a government in Germany. Um, 
and and you know that has been like a, a stabilizing event in, in European politics. Is there anything you know anything good to come out of this as you see it? You know, if we look at the European Union as a as a whole. First of all, if you look at the at the um, opinion polls, uh, support for the EU it's never been as high as it is right now. Uh, I know that we have a situation in Italy right now, but I think it has to do with domestic politics. Uh, they have always, always messed up in, in Italy. Uh, I, I lived in Italy for four years, so I, I, I love that country and I simply don't understand it. I mean, Berlusconi was in charge when I lived there. Now he's, well, at least he thought he was going to be in charge again. Um, but but uh, um, I think if you look at, at, at opinion polls uh, since Brexit, they have only gone one way and that is up in support. I think that's very positive. I actually think that Brexit can, has been a wake-up call for a lot of Europeans. Uh, I don't hear many voices in Denmark anymore uh, saying we should also leave, you know. Uh, it's, it's very few. Uh, also when you look around, uh, Marine Le Pen now doesn't want to leave the Euro. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, the Freedom Party in, in Austria, all of a sudden it's great to be in the EU. I mean, it may, it may go back, it may reverse, but, but I think this whole process has been so chaotic and so confusing and showing the worst of politics, really, that people are saying, Jesus Christ, let's not go down let's that not way. Do that. So, so, and also I think the fact that Macron is now in the Elysée Palais and, and uh, we have a stable government in Germany, it all points in the right direction for stability in Europe. And I'm not so afraid of the Italians. They're going to find out a solution. Thank you very much, Klaus and uh, Marie. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, heard today that uh, Brexit is a really complex issue. Uh, there are many aspects. Uh, we have since uh, June 24th, 2016, received a number of questions from our members in the UK. Uh, I don't know why they believe that I would have a crystal ball which was clearer than anybody else's. Uh, but it shows the, the worry that everybody is having uh, as to what is going to happen. It concerns our individual members, what will happen with the citizens' rights, but it certainly also concerns all our corporate members. Uh, I was last week at PWC's annual uh, presentation of the CEO survey, and uh, Danish CEOs were asked which countries they see as the most important market for growth. In 2017, the UK was the second with 39% of the CEOs viewing it as an important market for growth. This year, this is down to 20%. So, it has already been mentioned, this is also a decision which will hit the total economy in the UK very, very hard. Well, this is a complex uh, process. Um, I would like to thank uh, Marlene Wind, uh, Ambassador Klaus Grobe, and not, uh, as the last also Jakob Moll from Sendland to be here to steer us through this very interesting debate this afternoon. Thank you very much for taking time to come here. I believe that we are having some uh, uh, small presents uh, which are coming up. In, in order not to have any Me Too campaign here, we're having a, a male and a female presenter. Uh, no, no number of girls. <laughs> And we have some uh, refreshments uh, in, in the area. So thank you everybody for coming here this afternoon and for participating actively. Uh, it's highly appreciated that you back up uh, uh, in Danes Worldwide's arrangements. Thank you very much for today. <laughs>